Well, good afternoon. Very nice. So welcome. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody, and welcome to the spring 2016 semester. I do hope that you all had some time to, for rest and relaxation with family and friends. So we're back for another very busy semester, and we've got lots to share with you today. But we're going to kick it off, convocation today, this afternoon, with greetings from our Board of Trustees. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. John Knight. He's a member of the Los Rios Community College Board of Trustees. He is a long-term, oh wait, I get to give him his introduction. He's long-term community servant. He's been a supervisor with the El Dorado County Board of Supervisors and also served on their planning commission. Uh, both of his children attended Oak Ridge High School and attended Los Rios Community College. So we're very pleased to have him as a member of our Board of Trustees. And I give him extra bonus Falcon points because he does have on teal socks. Okay. So please welcome Mr. John Knight. Thank you, Rachel. And actually, what was really more important, they both graduated from a four-year university, so they went through the entire system, and that's what uh, we're all looking for. So, you know, it's an honor and a privilege for me uh, being uh, one of your elected officials uh, in this area and representing this fine college. And for those that are up at the El Dorado campus, I have been there. I know where it is, and I've been there many times. And so it's nice. I, I, I saw Dale here and a couple other people, so, you know, we we're, we're love to be a part of that community. I feel fortunate since being elected to this position that so many of you have come up and introduced yourself to me and have made me a you know, welcome member of your family and I really appreciate it. Despite a long-term relationship with Jerry Trahane, he does you know, at least welcome me and acknowledge me. And I, <laughs> so I really appreciate that, Jerry. And Alan Clark's not too bad either, so I know, know Alan Clark. Uh, this is a special day for all of us as we kick off the new year in the spring semester in such a beautiful and inspiring place such as this. But it's also my honor to, um, and I'd like to have you uh, join me in, in welcoming one of my other colleagues, and that would be Trustee Pamela Haynes. Pamela, please, please welcome Pamela. She initially uh, asked for directions on how to get here, but she came with uh, Brian uh, Chancellor King, so she knew how to get down here. So I appreciate that, Pamela. I know I speak for all of my colleagues uh, for this afternoon when I tell you how proud we are of all of you uh, and of the dedication of your passion for what you do for not only the community but for the college. We're also committed to providing each and every one of our students with access to the educational opportunities that we bring them success in the classroom, the workplace, and in their life. <clears throat> it is a new se semester, but it is the same commitment of excellence that all of you have exhibited over the last many years faculty, staffs, and students alike, and we applaud you for that. So thank you for all for being here. Now please join me in, in providing a warm welcome to our Chancellor, Brian King. Brian. Well, good afternoon. How are things going in Folsom today? Great to be with you, and uh, many of you know that we have multiple convocations during the day, so this is the fourth college that we've had a chance to attend. And uh, some people say it must be exhausting to give a presentation five times in one day. It's exhilarating, but I think the people who are exhausted are those who go with me along the way, and I want to introduce them. <laughs> Pamela Haynes on our board is going to all of the convocations, so let's acknowledge John and Pam again, our outstanding board members. Our Deputy Chancellor, Sue Lorimer, you know Sue here, I believe. General Counsel, J.P. Sherry. Mitchell Benson, Associate Vice Chancellor. Associate Vice Chancellor, Jamie Nye. And I don't know why our business officer, Teresa Matista, is over here by herself. But let's welcome Teresa. JP's going to keep her company. That's very kind. So seven words in the title of our conversation today, the presentation entitled Working Together to Chart a New Course. So you really could summarize the, the focal point here in two words, and I'm going to need your help several times today. Can you start with a little drum roll? A little drum roll. Condense 
working together to chart a new course into two words, strategic planning. Is that exciting? OK, let's try a little harder. Strategic planning. Now, the first reaction is probably more genuine than the second one, right? When you think about strategic planning, why is the reaction sometimes not so much excitement? We've done it before. You've gone through planning exercises that didn't really lead to anything different. Am I right? Have you had that experience? So strategic planning, the way we're going to do it, will be catalytic. It's going to be very powerful. But I do understand that when you think about strategic planning and all the time and energy that goes into it, you may begin with some questions about uh, why it's going to be valuable. And there's only two words in strategic planning, but a lot of words have been written about strategic planning. How many of you think you uh, have read most of the good books about strategic planning? Any kind of, are there any? So the question, is there a single one? I don't know. I think the odds are good there might be a good one or two. If you go to Amazon and look for strategic planning books, there's about 30,000. So a lot have been written indicating that at least the idea of doing str strategic planning well is important. And uh, I'll ask you, and, and you can shout out, does anybody have a favorite quote about planning? Sometimes people chuckle because you don't think about powerful quotes about planning. Anybody have a planning quote you like? Hope is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy. That's a good one. We have a strategic plan. It's called doing things. Anybody else? Anybody else have one you like? Life yes? Is what happens when you're busy making plans. Life is what happens when you're busy making plans. When you plan, God laughs. When you plan, God laughs. <laughs> All right. Yes? Fan failing to plan is planning to fail, which, depending on who you want to give credit, is either Benjamin Franklin or John Wooden. So a lot of these quotes, speaking who actually said it, is interesting. Anybody have another one you really like? Yes? I love it when a plan comes together. I love it when a plan comes together. For those of you under 40, that's a Mr. T reference back to the A team. So if you're thinking about the quotes and you go to the, the keeper of all information, Google, 86 million results in, 46, in, in half a second. So there's a lot of quotes about planning. And the good news is I'm only, only going to share about half of those quotes with you <laughs> in our time together today. Just kidding, of course. You can go beautiful imagery in quotes about planning, and you can go the classical philosophers. If one does not know to which port one is sailing, no wind is favorable. That makes sense? You can have great conditions, but if you don't know where you're going, it doesn't really matter. So you have to have the destination in mind. Be honest. Are you going to remember that quote on Monday? Probably. Oh, yes? <laughs> Good. Well, we start Tuesday, but there will be a Monday in between. So there's one flavor of quote. Now, I'm not going to make any other guarantees except this one. The next quote you will remember on Monday and Tuesday. Do you believe me? You got a quote on planning that you'll remember? And I, the guarantee is if you don't remember on Monday or Tuesday, Give me a call, and I'll refund everything you paid to be here today, OK? <laughs> so that's the deal. You ready for the quote? An American thinker and philosopher said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> Have you heard that one? Who said that? Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson. <laughs> so I'm not a big Mike Tyson fan. I don't watch boxing. But it does resonate a little bit, this idea that you have a plan, and then stuff happens along the way, that you're going to be challenged along the way. And uh, interestingly, I'm, I'm going to recommend some books. I don't recommend this one. When I was looking up this quote from Mike Tyson, a guy named Lucas Mack actually wrote a book using that quote. So everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. I don't know if it's a good book or a bad book. I just thought it was funny that Mike Tyson has found his way into literature. <laughs> so planning has to happen together. And why we plan together was sort of summarized in a discussion I had with my teenage daughter on Wednesday night. So how many of you, like me, have teenagers at home living with you still? I guess if you have teenagers and they're, they're out on the street, that's a bad thing. So <laughs> having a teenager in the house is always interesting. And they say things that make a lot of sense when we're having conversations. And I had a, a late night conversation with my daughter, Celia, on Wednesday. And as many of you know, when I'm preparing for convocation, the world is a focus group. 
So I think a lot about how to get ideas communicated in a way that makes sense and, and testing different ideas. And, and I got into a discussion with Celia about planning and I said, well, are you a planner? Do you like to plan? And what she said, I think is probably true for most of us, she said, well, I don't like your plan, but I like it when we plan. Is that true for you? Do you like it when someone else hands you the plan that says this is the plan? We don't have ownership of it, we don't have involvement, and we don't have communication in developing the plan. So we are going to plan together. My presentation today is not telling you what the plan is going to be. My focus is going to be on talking about the environment and some forces at work as we craft the plan together. And uh, much work is already underway, but there are four town hall meetings. You can attend any of these if the one at Folsom Lake isn't convenient for you. You can attend any of the strategic planning meetings. And we also have a lot of information on our website. And uh, Tuesday, when you get back after the holiday break, we'll have a chancellor's note that includes links to all the web websites I refer to and also a bibliog bibliography of the resources. So if anything catches your fancy in terms of books or websites, we'll have those links. And uh, two of the books that I will uh, refer you to are also available through our libraries. Thanks to the librarians for working with me to make books that I mentioned available through the library as well. So I saw Steve Weiss. Steve, raise your hand. Steve is working with us as our expert in planning. And I don't want to pick on Steve. This seems to be true of everyone involved in planning I have ever talked to. They have a fear about where a plan ends up. Now, there are a lot of bad places a plan could end up, right? In the trash can, that would be bad. In a shredder, in a bottom drawer. But where, do, where does everybody involved in planning say the plan shouldn't end up? Let's all say it together. On a shelf. So. It makes sense that if the document isn't used, if it's not actually uh, uh, something that gives us guidance, the process is not very effective. And the good news is at Los Rios, our last opportunity to do strategic planning together was in 2011, and that plan has not sat on a shelf. It's guided our budgeting decisions. It's, gu it's guided programming decisions. So it's part of our DNA for planning to be something that we do all the time and that we refer back to. So when you think about 2011, uh, pausing for a moment to think what was going on in the world in 2011, these aren't necessarily the most important events. And, uh, and every year when, we, when you start looking at what happens in a year, some of the first examples I had were all bad things, and everybody said we don't want to talk about that. So some things that did happen in 2011, there was a royal wedding. How many of you watched the royal wedding? No judgment here. <laughs> How many of you aren't that interested in what goes on? Okay, and I see my bride around the corner, Christina, is over here. Oh, <laughs> hiding in the wings. I said, well, I, come here, come here, Christina. This is my first wife, Christina. <laughs> Thank you for being here. And I said something earlier today that since I knew she was going to be here, I better say again. When you look at this photo, at my wife's wedding, I would have loved to have worn a uniform like that. Wouldn't that have been cool? <laughs> Didn't have a chance to do that, though. Another event in 2011 was the last flight of a space shuttle. So you think about it, it's been five years since the space shuttle mission. This was the Atlantis. The best picture, timely reference. Yesterday, the Academy nominations came out. And this is not a movie about convocation presentations. How many of you have seen the King's Speech? <laughs> Good movie, best movie of 2011. And another event that I think was very exciting, do we have Giants fans here? What happened in 2011? The Cardinals won the World Series. <laughs> it's okay, Teresa, my Giants, we have a lot of friends who are Giants fans, and I root for the Giants except when they're playing the Cardinals as a lifelong Cardinal fan. A couple of numbers to take us back to 2011. 12.9, what, what's that number? What's 12.9? That was the unemployment rate in 2011. What's the unemployment rate now for the region? It's about 5%. So very different conditions now in that regard. 36 bucks per unit. What is it now per unit? 46. Does that drive enrollment up, having higher fees? No. So a good example of an external factor. We don't set our fees. The state does. 
Things are happening all the time that influence what we can and cannot do. In a five-year period in an organization as large as our district, a lot of things happen. 500 new regular employees joined our district in uh, the time between 2011 and 2016. I'm one of them. Would you stand if you became a regular employee of the district during that period? <laughs> Let's welcome all the relatively new people. So when you look around, fairly dramatic when you think about it. Even in a time where we didn't have a lot of new positions because of budget cuts, we did have new people. We had a new chancellor and a new deputy chancellor in that last five-year period, and I'm very hopeful that that will not be true in the next five-year period, <laughs> as I look at my two trustees who are with us here today. Soon we will have new presidents at all four of our colleges since 2011, so that's a very substantial uh, evolution in leadership. And uh, my predecessor, Bryce Harris, became state chancellor, and many of you know in a couple of months he's going to retire as state chancellor. So we'll have a new leader of the California Community College system soon. And just this past October, we concluded our accreditation visits, and we hope to hear from the commission very soon. And the recommendations and what we learn from the accreditation process will inform the planning process as we move forward. Facilities have changed, some tangible indications of change. Three of our centers came online in the last five years. The Davis Center of Sac City College, the Cosumnes River Elk Grove Center, and last but not least would be Rancho Cordova. A round of applause for Rancho Cordova. So when you start planning, one of the basic questions is looking forward in the future. Is it going to be business as usual? On one, on, on one end of the spectrum, you've got the needle status quo, we don't need to change anything. On the other end of that needle would be the whole world has changed and things are dramatically different. You could be somewhere in between. What do you think? Is it status quo business as usual in 2016? I hear some people saying no. Anybody think maybe so? How many of you think we're at the other end of that continuum? I hear some yeses and some noes. Our deputy chancellor thinks we're over here. How many of you think we're somewhere in between? Okay. We'll talk about that and, and five forces at work that, uh, that I think push us more towards this side of the equation. And the planning work, I want to emphasize, doesn't start at the town hall meetings. Many leaders, including people from Folsom Lake and our other uh, colleges, have all been involved in laying the groundwork for strategic planning. But without fail, every group that's been asked that question said that this is a time where things are changing quite a bit. Maybe not all the way to that spectrum, but every group we've met with have said we're well to the right of the middle in moving forward. So uh, we've talked about the process for planning. We've talked about a quick look back over the previous five years and all the things that happened during our previous uh, period of planning. And the bulk of our time together, I want to talk about forces at work that are going to govern what we do together in planning and frame it with a quote from Richard Rommelt, the most important element of a strategic plan is a coherent viewpoint about the forces at work not the plan itself. That makes sense? He's not saying the plan doesn't matter, but if there is not some consensus about the forces at work, if there's not an understanding of the water we're swimming in, how we get to where we need to be is really going to be pointless, or there won't even be agreement about the circumstances that we're working through. Make sense? So five forces at work, they're not in any particular order, although the fifth and final of these five, equity and the achievement gap, really is crucial and overarching and is very clearly uh, a top priority of our Board of Trustees. So we can talk about what the priority order is, but equity and the achievement gap is really an umbrella that uh, should give us focus on everything we do. Now I encourage you as we go through the, the presentation today, there may be something you think I've left out. There may be something that you disagree with me about. We don't have an opportunity in this forum for dialogue, but we will in our forums. And feel free to shoot me an email, and uh, you know my email address, and I'll put it up at the end of the presentation as well. So the first force at work is the increasing focus on accountability. And uh, I've got a quote that I need some help reading, and it's sort of a dark, ominous quote, and I'm wondering if we have anybody who does a really good Darth Vader. <laughs> Do we have anyone, anybody with a, anybody with a dramatic voice? <laughs> David? We got a volunteer? 
Are you volunteering? I, I just made the, the vocal sound. <laughs> okay. <sighs> There's that. And you're never going to get a cheaper round of applause than that. <laughs> what about the actual voice? Does someone have a good Darth Vader voice? Come on. You've got that voice. Yes. <laughs> no? Come on, Bernard. Let's go with I am, I am your father. No, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, well, spontaneity is a beautiful thing. So uh, let's practice now. Uh, the, um, a good one is I am your father, and the emphasis is on I. So all together, one, two, three, I, I am your father. So I want that voice as we read a quote together on accountability. Dark, deep, in an un if an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as, pause, an act of war. <laughs> Thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> a lot of drama. So what do you think about that quote? Some people are saying, yep, anybody think it's a little overboard, a little dramatic? Any Brian Regan fans, the comedian? You could say it's the epitome of hyperbole. It's pretty dramatic. It got a lot of play when it came out. Anybody know what that quote is from? Anybody know? A Nation at Risk, the report for, and the subtitle is The Imperative for Education Reform. So what year? come out? 83. So in some ways, the discussion about the need to do things differently in education isn't new. And when people say, well, it's just going to be the same old, same old, I, I understand why sometimes, because in some ways these discussions seem to be cyclical. What's different, though, in recent years, the Nation, uh, nation at Risk focused almost entirely on K-12 education, and the more recent focus has been on college. How many of you have a kid in college right now for, me, for your family? How many of you are paying for it? How many of you think you're paying too much for college? Affordability has been the lightning rod issue for higher education. As prices continue to soar, there's been an examination of higher education that wasn't happening in 83. It was pretty well accepted that higher education was outstanding in the United States, and it was and it is, but this has been a game changer, the rising costs. When you're looking at something, what something costs, what's your other question? Quality. So affordability and quality, we have had discussions and examinations of higher education that are very different in this national focus. How many of you watched the State of the Union address on Tuesday? President Obama again mentioned the need to make community college free for the first two years for everyone, and uh, probably has talked more about community colleges in the last eight years than any president before, which it's a chicken and the egg. He's talked about community colleges. There also has been a focus in other places on community colleges. States are doing things like the Tennessee Promise to make uh, community college affordable. Tennessee gets way too much credit. The California Promise is much broader and Board of Governors fee waivers. About two-thirds of our students don't pay fees. So let's give a round of applause for California. <laughs> the focus on completion has generated a lot of national attention and broad agendas with goals like this one. This is one of many, but increasing the percentage of adults with degrees and credentials by 60% by 2025. The Obama administration has used this language. Many other policymakers have. And it does fit that model we talked about in the fall for planning the X to Y by Z. So the X is the benchmark, Y is where you want to be, and Z is the time that you uh, plan to be there. And uh, I can't recommend the book, uh, Everybody Has a Plan Until They Get Punched in the Face, but I would recommend Redesigning America's Community Colleges. This is a book that's being read in Washington, D.C. It's being read by policymakers in California and around the country. And the authors are educators, so they're not just critics. They have worked with community colleges and looked at efforts over the last 10 years, some of that have worked, some that have not. And the metaphor that they use works okay after lunch. Did everybody get something to eat? I felt a little guilty at American River College where uh, the, the, we have the, the convocation right before lunch because the metaphor that they talk about is a buffet or a cafeteria. 
Does that make sense to you? The idea is that higher education and community colleges provide a lot of different choices, a lot of different choices. Now, I did say this is a cafeteria, but I had a culinary instructor tell me at one of our presentations this is actually a buffet. So it works either way in the metaphor, whether it's a cafeteria or a buffet. A lot of choices, not a lot of guidance. And uh, colleges and community colleges in particular, the authors say, have a lot of different choices. The food's all good for the most part, but not a lot of guidance in how to get a healthy meal at the cafeteria. So with that metaphor, the concept is we need to look at the items we have, our courses, but not focus solely on course production, but think about the entire meal. Is that a metaphor that resonates a little bit? Two things in their book that we'll want to talk about as we plan. The benefit of having fewer choices. Sometimes choices are overwhelming. And also having structured pathways. So that's another metaphor from the, from the cafeteria to a pathway with a guide. Guided pathways is sometimes the language. And it's not just our students who benefit from fewer choices. Anyone read The Paradox of Choice? I was surprised when I reread the book that it's been out longer than I thought because the ideas still are, are quite fresh. And uh, if you don't have time to read the book, he did a nice TED talk that's been viewed by more than 8 million people about the perception that more choice is always good, that liberty is about choice, and the reality that we all get overwhelmed with choices. So, you know, another food Im imagery of food, when you go to the grocery market, think about all the choices. It's overwhelming. If you know exactly what you want, you're okay, but if you don't, so many choices and a lot of research that indicates that if you have 40 choices, what are you likely to do? You may walk out. Or if you do make a choice, you don't feel like it was well informed and you don't feel as good about the choice. So again, it's not just students. Having too many choices can be difficult for all of us. Another example, transit, public transit in the region. So looking at another industry where maybe we have a little more objectivity, another, another business model. How many of you use public transit to get here today? Was anyone able to? How many of you would like to? OK, well, you've already anticipated my next question. Most of us would like to. Hardly any of us do use public transit. Why? It's not convenient, someone said. What else? Yes? OK. It, it takes longer when you know there's a, a shorter way to do it. That's frustrating when you know there should be a shorter way and there isn't. Any other thoughts on why it's hard? Yes? You live too close. Well, that's a good problem. You can walk. And this is not a criticism of transit in Sacramento. I was at a meeting this week where it sort of jumped out at me the similarity of some of the challenges that we have in education and in another regional effort for public transit. How, how many different entities do you think there are in our region that provide public transportation? And you know, we think about RT and light rail. That's a big one. But how many total? 21. 21 different entities provide public transportation, so we have thousands of trains and buses, but it isn't always as easy as it should be to get from point A to point B. And even if you know what, if you don't know what service is available, even when it is available, it's hard to find. So in community colleges, the good news is we have a lot of work underway. We're not starting from scratch in this idea of building pathways. The uh, Pathways Trust Grant has provided uh, several hundred million dollars to help build alignment between high schools and community colleges and career, career technical education programs. Another national effort, another statewide effort, I mean, for uh, structuring pathways is Common Assessment Initiative. How many of you are familiar with Common Assessment? More of you will be because in a fairly short period of time, all of the community colleges in California will be using one assessment instrument. Is that a good idea? Is it a bad idea? doesn't really matter in this instance because the, the motion is moving forward. So in some areas we get to choose, in some areas a decision's been made and our job in planning is how to implement in a way that makes the most sense. The online education initiative statewide, another example of a coordinating effort statewide, the idea to have online courses available to students from around the state so they can find online the courses they need to complete a program. And two, uh, and in the online education initiative, the, vendor that the project is working with is Canvas. 
So it doesn't mean we're going to have to use Canvas, but it's another area for conversation, and we have task force looking at what the best tool would be in online education. And two really big programs that I know everyone here has touched in some way, the Student Success Program and Student Equity, both looking at outcomes for students and how we can improve the pathway for our students. In the last year, a major pathway initiative that I'm excited about is dual enrollment. Our legislature passed a bill that allows greater opportunity for high school students to enroll in college courses while they're still in high school. And uh, that's not just for AP students. The real appeal to dual enrollment is that many students who otherwise would not be engaged at college are able to do that early on. And then we have a greater likelihood of bringing them to our campus later. Another ma major statewide effort is the baccalaureate degree program. 15 community colleges have a pilot baccalaureate program. None are in our district, but it's an area where if there, was, if there were a need in the community, we would look at a baccalaureate program. A great success for our district in building pathways is the associate degree for transfer. You're all familiar with the partnership with the California State University system where we narrow the course choices to ensure transfer in certain programs to CSU. And we are a statewide leader. How about a round of applause for Los Rios? 88 degrees and 27 majors since 2011. That's really something to be proud of. And even better, that's led to almost to more than 1,700 degrees. Let's, let's applaud that, too. 1,700 graduates in ADT programs. It's such a good idea that UC is now looking at building clearer pathways in programs from community college to the University of California. And the kickoff for this partnership was at our Davis Center of Sac City College. And you see President Janet Napolitano with our Chancellor Bryce Harris at one of our centers talking about this initiative. So very exciting. You can choose your metaphor. Is it a meal? Is it a map? Is it a pathway? But the planning question is, how do we look at the great menu of options we have for students, all these courses, and bring them to students in a way that makes them uh, better able to achieve their degree, whether it's a certificate or a degree or a transfer. So we're already doing some of that work. We just have to step it up and have uh, courageous conversations about how to do that as we work through strategic planning. So accountability, focus on accountability is one force at work that's not going to go away. Funding remains very volatile for California community colleges. And it's been a week and a day since Governor Brown un un unveiled his first crack at the budget for 2016-17. And all of you understand that the governor's proposed budget is not the final budget. There will be a lot of conversation with the legislature between now and uh, the end of the session. But that graph that he has there is one that we should be aware of where you see the black on the left and then the red on the right. And that is budget balance budgets of which there are relatively few in California, are almost always followed by huge deficit budgets. And he was spent a large part of his time on uh, last week warning that we've got some surpluses now, but that doesn't mean that the spending can keep going up because the recession will come sooner than we would like. So planning for the downturn. And then the governor linked accountability and funding in the budget summary in a way that is really uh, unprecedented. And if you have your budget book with you from the governor's summary, look, turn, turn to page 44. <laughs> this is pr from page 44 in the budget summary. And I don't want to get distracted with what the numbers are, but what they're trying to represent, that this is in the budget statement where the governor is pointing to the top and the bottom among community colleges. In this case, it happens to be remedial education in math and in English. And we're not going to get into what the numbers mean, but it really is a bit of a turning point to be including in the budget summary some outcomes for colleges. So do you think we're going to get more or less of that looking at our outcomes? The, the tendency is certainly towards more review of how we're doing, and there's going to be a greater linkage with funding than, than there has been in the past. Some quick details on the budget. It's not a budget we're thrilled about. The cost of living adjustment is a microscopic 4.7. A slight decrease in base funding, so not only were there not new dollars in the base, a slight decrease, our costs are going to continue to go up. We've talked and are working together about retirement costs and also health care costs have not increased much in the last couple of years, but we uh, suspect and are hearing that there will be significant increases in the coming years. The new dollars on growth, we'll talk more about the challenges we have with growth in a moment, 
but there is 2% in next year's budget for growth as there is in this year's uh, final budget. There is uh, directed money for career technical education pathways. We talked about the pathways partnership. And then 200 million for workforce development and 30 million for basic skills. So not disconnected, the governor identifies basic skills on page 44, then has specific funds for basic skills in his recommendation. So the short answer is the budget, uh, the roller coaster will continue. We will do our best to be uh, proactive in dealing with budget trends and making that movement. If the funds are going to be more linked with accountability, we need to be changing our system so that we're ready to capture those funds for our students. So the first two forces, accountability, funding, the third, safety and security, and probably the number one concern for faculty and staff and students in, in this troubling era is for safety and security. And it's been a top concern uh, at our district. It's been a paramount concern for many years. That ongoing commitment to safety continues. And I understand at Folsom Lake today, you've spent a, a, a large chunk of uh, your time today on safety and security, which is time well spent. When we had the tragic events at Sac City on September 3rd, when we had a fatal shooting, I want to thank the board. One of the first things that they approved, uh, first actions to take was to have an outside review of everything that happened because we wanted an objective look at a crisis like that. What can we learn from it and what can we do better? And as soon as the outside review was completed, the board approved it and made it public so anyone can read it. And on the whole, there uh, was reinforcement that our police officers did a great job, our law enforcement, on the uh, text notification system. We had areas for improvement, which we have implemented. And every time something happens, we're going to be very open and very transparent about what happened, what we can do better, and what we uh, can learn from it. And our preparedness assessment team was in place for many years before the tragic shooting and continues to meet learning from this event and others how to improve our safety. One enhancement that I, I believe many of you have talked about earlier today was the Ernie system. So on your computer now, if you're in a situation where you can't call our law enforcement, you can click on the Ernie icon and uh, our, our public safety and, and police officers will be notified that there is an issue and, and are able to come to you. Training, the problem is not having enough training. The, tra the problem is having training accessible so people can get to it. We have all sorts of training, including the training that many of you went through this morning, and it's ongoing. Our uh, law enforcement does a great job. And we have now on the Los Rios Police Department page specific information on campus safety. And Chief Sears, will you stand? Chief Sears has done a great job. A great job working with others to get information you can use on the website. And uh, one example of uh, videos that are there, how many of you have watched uh, a video on active shooter training? How many of you have not and are going to? Those are really the only two choices <laughs> because it is poignant, it is unsettling, but it is essential. And watching one of the two videos, they're both great. I watched them again yesterday. One is from a university and one is from the FBI. We have to do everything we can to prepare ourselves for the unthinkable crisis that could happen in hopes that it never happens. But you can't, Chief Sears can't make me safe. No one person can. We have to work together to be informed uh, about the best way to be prepared for the next crisis. And we know the next one will be different from the last one. So it's always a learning process when things happen. But we're going to do everything we can in providing information to keep our students, faculty, and staff safe. So the fourth force at work is enrollment flat or declining in our district. We talked about the enrollment challenges in the fall. And uh, crystal balls are imperfect, but part of planning is projecting into the future. So back in 2011, the chancellor's office estimated how many students our district was likely to serve in 2011. Are you with me? 2011, looking into the crystal ball, how many students now? What do you think the guess was? 103,000. 103,000 students. How many will we actually serve this fall? About 77,000. So it's not a criticism of the prognostication, just acknowledgement of how, thing, how much things can change in five years. We're very high unemployment rate, much higher enrollment, lower unemployment rate. A lot of things impact enrollment. And as I said, this year's budget includes 2% in growth funds. The proposed budget includes 2% in growth. 
From a fiscal standpoint, if we can grow 2%, that's $5 million in new dollars. Same is true for next year. The challenge is that we're basically flat or slightly down. In the fall, we were a little bit down from the fall of 14. And the latest numbers, Teresa, do we have any numbers for today? These are yesterday's numbers. So we're down. But that's right. You've been stuck with me all day. How would you know? So we're not going off a cliff in terms of enrollment the way some of our sister colleges in Northern California are, but we're, we're flat. So we're continuing to do the things that we know work. Increasing persistence is good for enrollment. It's also good for student completion. We're looking for new students. One of many examples is dual enrollment, the opportunity to find high school students who would benefit from taking a high school, uh, college class while they're in high school. So the two things we're doing and continuing to focus upon is increasing persistence and identifying new students who could benefit from an education with us. And all of you have seen the district-wide Save Your Spot campaign, a very collaborative effort among all of the colleges to have a consistent theme, encouraging students to enroll soon and encouraging them to re-enroll and come back in the following semester. So if we don't grow this year, and it looks likely that we won't, we don't have uh, much runway left between now and the end of the reporting year, it means that we'll be in stability, so the state doesn't reduce our funding, but we don't capture that, that up to $5 million in growth dollars. So it doesn't mean we have to cut the budget, but those new resources aren't there. And that is uh, a, one of many reasons why it will remain a key planning topic growth and access in the coming year. So the fifth and final topic is the most important of the five, and the best argument why the status quo just isn't good enough. That we work hard, we've done good work in our district for more than 50 years as we celebrated our 50th anniversary last year, but we have to confront the stark reality that outcomes are not the same for all of our students. And the next slide I wanna share with you is a graph so it's not people, but you think about the people behind these numbers in terms of outcomes. So this is all students prepared and un unprepared from the student success scorecard. And you look at the huge gap between Latino and black students, African American students, completing at about a 39% rate, compared to Asian students almost 67% and white students about 53%. Not to say that any of those numbers are as high as we need them to be, but it is morally unacceptable to look at what we're doing and say those outcomes are okay. Am I right? You agree? Is it time to look at doing what we need to do to close those gaps? It's past time, and our strategic planning process is going to provide us an opportunity to do that. We have to look at what we can do to improve outcomes for all of our students, and the achievement gap and equity for our students is uh, at the heart of our work together. So I want to wrap up with two other numbers to keep in mind when we think about what our students are overcoming when they come here on Tuesday and throughout the semester. There was a study completed at the end of last year called Hungry to Learn. And the study looked at students at 10 colleges around the country, about 4,000 students looking at the challenges they face in terms of food insecurity, hunger, and housing insecurity or homelessness. So the numbers may vary a little bit, but a good national sense of challenges that college students are facing, community college students in particular. What percentage of students nationwide do you think are facing food insecurity? The survey said about 20%, so about one in five of students are making really difficult decisions before we ask them to choose from a w wide array of choices at college. They're having to make decisions like, will I eat or not? Same thing with housing security and homelessness. What percentage of students in the nationwide survey had fundamental insecurity as far as their living arrangements? It's 13% nationally, so again, about one in 10. So the previous chart where you see numbers, it's about people this really gets to the heart of the matter, that in working together, access to students is at the heart of what we do, making sure they're successful because we are the pathway to prosperity for the students who are with us. We want to get them out of insecurity about their next meal and where they live and get them on the path to success. So I really appreciate the chance to be with you today. Appreciate your feedback about what you've heard today. 
not just in email, but also at our town hall meetings and throughout the semester. So have a wonderful semester, and I will turn it back over to Rachel Rosenthal, president of Folsom Lake. Thank you.